today is now and then. Dream smokes touch the clouds. On a day when death didn't die. Real world time tricks shadows lie. Red, white, perception, deception. Predator tries civilizing us. But the tribes will not go without return. Genetic light from the other side. A song from the heart. Our hearts to give. The wild days. The glory days live. Crazy horse, we hear what you say. One earth, one mother. One does not sell the earth. The people walk upon. We are the land. How do we sell our mother? How do we sell the stars? How do we sell the air? Crazy horse, we hear what you say. Crazy horse, we hear what you say. We are the seventh generation. We are the seventh generation. Comments made during the following broadcast of No Bones About It do not necessarily reflect the views of the staff, management, or underwriters of KAOS Radio or the Evergreen State College. If you would like to express another opinion, address your comments to the general manager, KAOS, the Evergreen State College, Cap 101, 2700 Evergreen Parkway Northwest, Olympia, Washington, 98505. To arrange a time for your own commentary, contact the general manager at 360-867-6895 during regular weekday business hours. And this is Raven Redbone, and uh, you just heard Crazy Horse um, by John Trudell. And uh, it's about 10 after 8, and uh, Dan 2 Cardinal um, will be calling in in a few minutes, and we'll put her on the, the air and have her share with us. I'm excited. And then uh, we have a special guest coming up at... Uh, Five o'clock, um, pulling into the uh, Evergreen State College campus. You'll actually be sitting uh, behind me. I'm excited about that too, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about um, actually. Tantu Cardinal is Metis is one of the most renowned indigenous actors in the world. Throughout her acting career, Tantu has done much to minimize the inaccuracies and stereotype portrayals of indigenous people that tend to infect m mainstream media, bringing instead a genuine warmth and understanding to her very human characters. So she should be calling in very soon, and um, we'll, we'll have a little chat and uh, visit, and I'm excited. Till then, we're going to just play this uh, song, put it out there, and then uh, around quarter to five, I'll, I got some events to share with you that are happening around the Walsh area, the Salish Sea. Um, and this one's called Prayer and its Journey into the Sound. And here we go. And thanks for listening.
Du Cardinal on the on the line. And how are you this evening? Oh, I'm all right. How are you? I'm good, good. Thanks for uh, calling back in and uh, um, appreciate you taking time tonight. I know that your your schedule is really busy, and um, I just uh, appreciate it. I'm kind of really laid back here. I'm I'm hoping that um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your career and how you got started and um, I know you, you're right. You're a writer, and um, you're also a, an activist. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Idle No More and your thoughts on the tar sands and uh, whatever's on your heart. So, first, want to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, and uh, again, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Tantu Cardinal, and um, I guess uh, my involvement came from an essential I don't know more kind of impulse. <laughs> uh, I was raised up in northern Alberta and uh, raised in a northern community that they considered isolated uh, until the road road got built through and uh, and now it is the heart of the tar sand uh, in Fort McMurray. But I was raised in a community just uh, south of there, about 30 miles. And until the highway bu got built, it was uh, pretty slow. It was the railroad that um, brought in everything from the outside. Um, and uh, I guess my initial uh, involvement uh, stemmed from seeing the inequity, the racism, uh, the complete uh, misrepresentation of our people. Hi. Hello? Oh, I'm listening. I'm sorry. Yeah, and um, I know that... Uh, that uh, I'm really sorry. I was just really attentive to what, what, you're, what you're saying. And so um, I know that uh, I've been talking to quite a few folks about the tar sands issue it's, itself and knowing that it's... Um, I have this in my head. Uh, um, Russ Wheeler was talking about how it's the largest carbon bomb, and uh, and it takes um, two uh, two barrels of oil to dig in to get one bar barrel of oil there, and, and then it uh, makes this black lake that that kills the the environment there, and uh, the fish and the the birds and things like that. So it's just um. You know, um, with your your activism as, and coming up that way, you're, um, how for us that are that are here in the in the states, how can we help? Um, I know that I've been doing petitions and getting the word up. How how can we um, gather to to um, help? What state are you? We're in Washington State. We're right on the Washington. right on the the water, right here. Up in well, the, in the up. Well, you got um, lots to uh, to do to help there. Uh, I'm sure that um, you're. I, I know you have uh, organizations. You have a movement that are a part of trying to stop the pipelines that going to the coast. Because if there's any oil spills, that whole section um, is up for the same kind of treatment as uh, the Gulf. If there's any uh, spills and where they're planning on putting those ships in to pick up that oil is really, really dangerous, precarious uh, in terms of what the shoreline is like, how big those ships are, um, uh, unpredictability of, of weather, and uh, weather is not getting any, any milder. <laughs> Uh, with uh, the effects of global warming, that's what created such Sandy being such a crazy system, because there was about three different systems that came together at the same time. And um, going back to my upbringing, uh, I was raised in the bush, basically. It was a very small community. I uh, couldn't even really call it a hamlet, I guess. But uh, being raised by my grandparents and uh, by people who live close to the bush. So I grew up with a sensibility and a, uh, I guess what we call nowadays a relationship 
with the earth in a sense that we we always grew up and and felt uh, the life of uh, of the earth. And then coming into a society in the city where there is absolute uh, oblivion uh, about the earth, uh, and you know whether it was something to you know complain about, and and there was just no connections. So it was a real feeling of desolation when I first got to the city, and and that uh, is a part of what perpetuated huge culture shock and and made life very difficult. Uh, but when I ran into the film business and I saw on the call sheet that it was marked on there what time the sunrise was, what time sunset was, what the weather was going to be like, what the winds were, all that kind of stuff, right there on the call sheet. And so that made me feel like, okay, Maybe this is a part of the society that I'll be able to live with these people. And sure enough, you know, uh, I've built uh, alliances with people that are in the arts. And and uh, that uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of a solace, I guess, uh, since I come from uh, a place where, as far as I'm concerned, I'm landless because it's been completely taken over by the tar sands and by the corporate movement of things. And uh, I'm uh, from the Métis, the Métis world. I don't have a reserve. I have to make application to get my treaty status um, to be a part of that land again. But as it is, uh, I'm not. So, uh, so the another alliance that's kind of uh, come to be is the people that are involved in the environmental movement. And, and I felt for a long, long time that the, there was a missing link in that, uh, you know, there's a lot of important work that was being done by environmentalists. And, and uh, one uh, Japanese-Canadian um, scientist, uh, David Suzuki, Dr. David Suzuki, who's been uh, just consistently pushing forward, pushing forward, pushing forward. And he's one of the ones that understood the connection with the earth, that organic and spiritual connection with the earth. And he's, he's done many books and he's done a lot of work and he's always credited our people uh, for being involved, uh, for being instrumental in, in making any headway in our protection of the earth. So this is what the Idle No More movement is really kind of really making clear. Um, because I was watching the environmental movement and watching it go into Occupy and, and this always felt that the, that the missing link was indigenous people. And now with Idle No More, and Idle No More is about this legislation that the Canadian government has brought forward, um, in in many cases, completely diminishing and obliterating environmental protections to water, and also uh, the headway that's been made by Indigenous nations uh, for sovereignty and self-government, all of those things, uh, the, with this new legislation, giving back to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs uh, this authority that it's been so long, it's been such a process of getting uh, out of the Indian Act and, and getting authority for life decisions back um, to the Indigenous people. And that's being eroded. There's so much being eroded in, in this big bill. But with Idle No More, it's it's very pointed. People say, you don't know what it's about. There's too many issues. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. It's about the water. It's about the land. And I guess what confuses people is that it's through treaty rights that these things have to be respected. Um, so there's by standing up for Indigenous rights, your Indigenous rights, by standing up for protection of water, 
by standing up for protection of the land. These are all things that each individual can do, can be involved in, and uh, and put pressure on your own leadership to really take into consideration what uh, the grassroots people, the indigenous people, the people that have to drink the water and uh, and to live on the land. And, and, uh, and I don't know more is talking in terms of not just the boundaries of the, of the reserves. No, uh-uh. it's the land, it's the planet. And, uh, and I, I think that that's, it's, it's power in that uh, we're connecting with people all over the planet that have been fighting this battle and um, trying to save their water and trying to save their land. I know there's strong alliances with the people in South America and all over the planet. So it's certainly something that anybody can be involved in. It's about protecting the water. It's about protecting the land. Yeah, it's always been about the water and the land. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I just think of where we're at. We're surrounded by water all around us, and uh, the, it needs our help. It's... Uh, you know, it's polluted, and I know that that uh, putting a pipeline would just uh, destroy the rest of the 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 water that's here. And it's like you said, um, what brings to mind is that the indigenous folks here have always lived on these watersheds, and they know that these watersheds better than anyone. And it's time that we we listen. And the thing that I love about Idle No More is that it, it what you said it has no boundaries. You know, it's it's everyone. Everyone should be involved in some some level of because uh, it's affecting the whole planet. That's right. Absolutely. If you drink water, it affects you. And if Canada goes ahead, if this this bill can't be rescinded, then the whole world is in trouble. Yeah, that's what because that if it just clears the way, they don't have to listen to any environmental stuff. And what it does is it gets rid of the authority of the treaties, and uh, and then they can just go ahead and do what they want to do. And that is that is death, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and it's like you said too. It's a uh, um, the indigenous people. It has to be led by the indigenous folks. And I know in Canada, I'm listening to. Um, some of the news that I that I'm been listening to is that uh, they they never gave up their their land. Period. No treaty. No. Or, you know. And no. That, and so and so it's uh, th- the government needs to listen and needs to 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 open their th- for me it's their their heart and listen and and understand what's what's really going on and that the people the people don't want this. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, I think the big disconnect in that is that they've known all along that the land wasn't given up, but they just stubbornly refused. They decided to just go ahead and interpret it the way they wanted it interpreted. You know, they figured that I, I think it was just, okay, we'll sign this and we'll do what we want to do because they're a bunch of uneducated people anyway. And we got them where we want them. We got them locked up on the reserves and... They're depending on us for food and everything, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm just a little cynical that there is a lack of understanding. I think it's uh, just a belligerent decision that's gone on for a very, very long, long time, and now it's habit. And so now we have to go back and we have to really clarify uh, some truth. Absolutely, we got to redefine. Uh, I think for. Uh myself as a I'm 45 uh, redefine my place um in that that whole the wheel and 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 have the voice that you're you're talking about that uh you know, we we don't need we don't want this we don't need this we're not we're not going to comply to this and uh you know the I know that um the treaties uh need to be honored and uh so I and I know that the the people just I think it's so exciting um uh, just looking at all the movement uh, throughout the world and know that people are are standing up and um I'm grateful for our relatives in Canada that uh that have come together. I know that the I can't remember the number. I think it was 26 or 28 of the tribes signed the 
that uh, that document that said there there's no way that you're coming through here. You know, and uh, so I I think it's exciting. I think what you were saying um, is very important that uh, indigenous folks, especially the young folks, uh, step up and and f- and say no more. Like I don't uh, I know that's what it's about, but you know, and just keep keep going with our voice. I know that the world's listening, and I'm really grateful for uh, what uh, Chief uh, Spence is doing and bringing attention to to something that would normally wouldn't make the headlines. Yeah, well, they, it did not make the headlines for a while, and uh, it kind of curiously enough, the the national um, broadcasters didn't. Um, publicize what was going on uh, on the on the ground until after the Senate had voted on C forty five. I find it really curious that that uh, you know CBC, CTV, all these national broadcast people didn't do any national stories on these demonstrations. What we were doing all across the country until the Senate had their final vote. And it was just as if they they were muzzled un, until the vote was done, you know, in case it would it would uh, cause these uh, so-called legislators to take a second look at it. And in Canada, the Senate, they're they're just kind of yes people. Right? They just it's all done already, and they just go yes. And uh, this is one of the biggest bills that's ever been done. Uh, so there's just all kinds of things in it. And um, and the lawmakers didn't didn't read it through, couldn't have read it through. I mean, this is really uh, this legislation is is really really horrific, horrific. Well, I know that that uh, happens here too in the the states where I think a lot of things try to get passed through, and the you know I know and. Um, myself i you know i i now i read everything from cover to cover that i get but i know that there was a time that i it's just i didn't really i not that i didn't understand it they used when my uncle used to sit with my uncle and he said that they're trying to take away our rights again could you find the bill and i could always find it because i work in a library and i could find it but i could never really interpret it so we always needed some type of lawyer Mm -hmm. to look at it and uh and 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 again, that he was right. They were trying to take the the, the rights away, and um, they were masking it in, in these things that uh, that I I know for myself. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm grateful that a lot of our people now are are getting getting degrees, and they're coming back and they're interpreting these things and uh, and helping. It's it's because. I know that they've been trying to do this since day one, and so it's... I know. Uh, well, see, this is the thing. The, the sweet piece of all this, the I don't know more, and those four women, I think three of them are lawyers, and and one is a teacher. So yeah. that part is taken care of, you know. Uh, that the, You're no longer dealing with people who don't know the language, yeah, it's absolutely true, and and I know, like, and I think about how over the years of the ancestors, and they bring these documents, and they don't really, you know, know what they're signing, and then they're doing it in good faith, and uh, and then all these atrocities happen. And uh, and, uh, and then another thing too, like one of the the women, I I don't know much about the backgrounds of the other ones, but. Uh, I know Sylvia McAdam, she also comes from the traditions and from the ceremonies. So, you know, we got double edged we got a double edged sword going on. I think it's awesome. So just um I'm coming back to your your career, I uh, just wanted to talk how did how did you get involved in film and how do you how do you pick your, your roles? You you see your roles are amazing that uh you seem to uh, discover or they discover you how does that happen well it's uh I've, I've really had kind of a blessed path um i don't know if you heard anything about um a, a court i don't even know what the the legal terms of it are but in canada last week 
the Métis non-status people um, got, uh, oh, jeez, I wish I could, uh, I could know what the word is, but were instated into the Constitution. And um, a late heart brother of mine um, was involved politically in that process and in getting um, Métis and non-status people involved in the, uh, incorporated into the Constitution and uh, the amendments that were being made in the, in the 80s. And uh, so actually it was he that was, cast in a docudrama in CBC back in the early 70s, like maybe 70, 71, um, because I, none of us knew that he had a uh, theater background. And uh, here he was uh, cast in this, and he put my name down as somebody who could come in and, and play one of the roles. And uh, he put two of our names down, and the other woman didn't show up. So I ended up getting the role. This was uh, at a time when Canada was trying to strengthen its culture because the U.S. was pretty well taking over everything. I mean, everything that was on the air and television and radio, magazines and, and taking, buying land, taking over land and businesses. And, and so uh, Trudeau came in and, and decided to strengthen the Canadian culture. And he poured a bunch of money into the arts and communications and, and all kinds of other things and bringing about this Canadian content ruling where a certain percentage of everything that was aired had to be Canadian. So uh, within that was this germ of thought. Uh, they had to do Canadian stories. Well, why don't we hire Native people to play Native roles? So Harry got a role that way. And he put my name up because I was kind of involved politically, you know, with the Native youth. And he knew that uh, I would stand up in front of a crowd and and say things. So he figured that uh, maybe I'd be good at this, I guess. Mm -hmm. So he put my name down and, uh, and that was it. And I was looking for some place that I could make a contribution anyway, since I barely made it through high school. And, uh, and so that's what happened. And uh, all the roles that have come my way, uh, you know, I mean, there's some that I turned away and, and uh, wouldn't be involved with, but I've been really blessed with uh, the things that have come my way. And, uh, and it, it was not, it's, they're not perfect pieces by any stretch. But there was always work to do. There was always work to do to try to, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> reinterpret or, <coughs> excuse me, bring in another angle, whatever, you know. Yeah, it's exciting. Like I just am <coughs> reading your list of uh, North of 60, Shattered, Legends of the Fall, Dances with Wolves, Black Robe, Loyalties, Education of the Little Tree, <coughs> Luna, Spirit and the Whale. Sioux City, Silent Tongue, Smoke Signals, and I know that uh, um, was it uh, older was Georgina Lightning's film um, about the boarding schools. Uh, I forget the, the title of that. Uh, older than America. Is it? That's what I thought it was. Older than America, and uh, <coughs> so like all these great movies that um, that you've been able to be a part of and be a. Um, an excellent voice for the first people, uh, native people, and uh, showing them in a like a non-stereotypical way. Like I know that that's one of some of the things that you look for, but you know, I I think it's awesome, and I know that uh, there should be more native people in film. Yeah, well, it's a process, and uh, the industry has been growing and developing. Our filmmakers have been growing and developing over time, and um, it's on the way. So do you do you feel that um, it's uh, people are more, I don't want to say upset, uh, accepting, but for for native people to get roles? Because I've been, I just finally got a chance to watch this uh, a film called uh, Real Engine, and how over the years they show different times in the period of uh, 
indigenous people and how they were shown in film and uh some of them not so good up until you know into into the 90s where they're finally getting a really strong voice do you feel that that's that that's uh happening throughout canada as well oh yeah I mean, uh, that that film was definitely, uh, you can't tell the history of those films without, I mean, Canada is not separate from that. If, if you see most of the, a lot of the actors uh, came from Canada. And I think that has a lot to do with that Canadian content ruling in that we had a lot of experience. There's a lot of um, local filmmakers, uh a lot of opportunity to tell our stories. And we have a different position in the society here in Canada than Native Americans do over there in the States. In the States, it seems like they still like to pretend that uh, Native Americans don't exist, that they manage to wipe them out, you know, mm -hmm. and get that feeling. So, you know, I'm really hoping that uh, Idle No More is going to be able to bring to that consciousness over there in the States that, yeah, Indigenous people are here. You did not wipe us out, you know? Absolutely. And I know that you were, you were working on a short story and wanted to, to share a little bit of that with us. and. Um, Oh, I did a short story that was published in an anthology. Uh, the book was called Our Story. Just hang on a sec. Mm -hmm. The book is called Our Story, Aboriginal Voices on Canada's Past. And, uh, and if you... You know your way around. I don't know if they'd have any of this in the, in U.S. books in libraries. I kind of doubt it, unless they've got a really advanced um, uh, indigenous book section. Let's see. One, two, three. Let's see. There's about nine different authors. I've written short stories in the book. And uh, I haven't done, I haven't really published anything. I haven't done any writing that, that I would publish, so I keep on saying that I got to do it. I'm going to do it. I got to do it. But I get keep getting swept around by the winds that are in the acting world. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, it's an anthology of uh, short poems. Is that uh, st short stories? No. Short stories, yes. And I, I um, so yeah. I know if uh, folks that are listening, they go into uh, there's a cataloging system called OCLC and the library, and it's uh, WorldCat dot org, and you can type in uh, the name of the book and uh, anthology of short poems or no, stories. No, it's not poems. Yeah, I'm stories. sorry. I, I, yeah, stories, uh, and. Uh, you can pull. I know like, you can pull it up. And uh, um, what's the name of the the story? My story. Yeah. Is um. It is. There is a place. So you, you type that in, and I'm sure that you can pull something up. And uh, if people wanted to to get a get a hold of a, a the book. Where would, where would we be able to find that? Well, this is what I don't know. I mean, uh, it's published by Random House of Canada. Okay. So we can go on that website. I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, poke around and then I'll I'll put a link out on uh, Facebook and on, my, on my blog. Our story: Aboriginal voices on Canada's past. Okay, and uh, we got about uh, you know ten minutes or so. I just wanted to. If there was something on your heart that you wanted to share with us, uh, uh, our relatives here, and uh, I again, I appreciate all that you do for the people and and your constant, uh, you're just really consistent, and you're out there and you share with your heart and uh, you uplift the the folks. I, I know when I was telling uh, people that uh, you were going to call in and share with us tonight, they were real excited and they were hoping oh, that I hope we record it. And then I said I will and I'll put it out there. And, 
But it's just that uh, I know for myself, because uh, uh, I'm a, a mixed blood person myself, and my grandfather was from the St. Regis area of, of Quebec in that area. Mm. So, so um, I appreciate um, your voice. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You never know, you know. You're just going out there because you're here. <laughs> Alrighty. So again, I appreciate you taking time. All right. All right. So is that it? Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, all the best. All right. Same to you. And keep in touch. And uh, 